Okay. I don't know if anyone doesn't know me, I'm Jeff Dutra. I've been coming to this user group off and on for the last couple of years. And I eventually tricked Lori into letting me speak. <laughs> That's pretty much it. So you probably signed up for the meetups, so you know what basically I'm kind of talking about. You maybe read the overview. But basically, I've spent the last decade of my life working in the web, mostly Microsoft. So that's a lot of ASP.NET web forms. Anyone here use ASP.NET web forms before? Oh, yes. Anyone love it? Keep your hands up. <laughs> Just me? Ken? Yeah. Oh, nice. It is fantastic. I love uh, six megabyte view state. It's great. <laughs> what can be wrong with that? So I'm just going to talk about like some processes. <laughs> so you have legacy apps. We don't always do file new project all the time. It's very rare. The only time you really see it a lot of times when you come to something like this. So I say, you know what? I'm not going to do any file new projects today. There'll be no new projects. But because in general, that's not what we do, right? In general, we have an old, usually, unless you're in a startup, you have an old existing app that you want to add some new functionality to. And a lot of times, you can look at some options, but it's like you have to rewrite everything to happen. So we want to avoid that. because. People aren't going to let us do that, right? Unless you own the company, it's not going to happen. So, all the code and everything from all the examples on the GitHub page, I will post. It's right there, but I'll post it after. The presentation on SlideShare is there. All that stuff like that. You can fork on GitHub, do whatever you want. There's like recipes, all that stuff like that. Not like cooking recipes, but I could do that if you really want, but they wouldn't be that good. Okay. Um, <laughs> It doesn't really matter, right? Like, it doesn't matter who I am or I'm not an authority. No one really is, especially in the web world. So it's like, I'm just hoping that you, something I give you is useful. Like, it doesn't matter that it's coming from me, because it's not really coming from me. There's been a lot of great people that have created these tools that we're going to show today. So, anyone ever hear of um, Dreyfus model? I have expertise. I'm the only one. That's okay. I'm going to read this right. So, what it basically is, is like, kind of like, Shows you where you are in your career, right? So you start off as this, and hopefully you work your way up. But what actually they found in the scales, and some people don't like this and debate it, is that people actually never pass this line. A lot of people, a good majority of people don't pass this line. Rare is to pass that line. I'm definitely not there. <laughs> I'm definitely not here, I used to be. And so for like a lot of my career, I was like here, but I thought I was here. That's the problem when you're here. You think you're up here. <laughs> but then when you get here, you're like, I feel like I'm down here. And so you never know where the hell you are. <laughs> so um, I try to become an expert. It's not easy, especially in the web, right? Just JavaScript library every week, there's like 16 more of them. And so you don't want to just jump on one and you get into it, then you find out the guy got a job, he's not supporting you anymore. And then you're stuck. <laughs> you do pull requests, and no one takes the pull requests on GitHub, and you can never make improvements. <clears throat> so like three parts, kind of three major parts, is one managing dependencies in your build with JavaScript, like Node.js tools like Gulp and Browserify. Anyone used Gulp before? Anyone? One person? Anyone not used Gulp before? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone not raise their hand yet? Because you have to be one of those two things, right? And so Browserify, so basically we'll kind of walk through that. But the main thing, as by the red highlighting, is this is what it's all about for me. Let's talk. Have anyone ever heard of Facebook's stack of React, Flux, and all that stuff like that? Anyone hear about it? Okay, so it's pretty exciting. It's quite a bit different. When you start seeing it, you're gonna be like, really like, what the hell is that kind of thing? Whether you go on their website or documentation, like, give it five minutes. In five minutes, you'll start kind of like, eh, it's not horrible. They used to, like, I love it now, I didn't feel bad. And we'll talk about why, like, it's, why I think it's good for legacy apps, because that's the main thing is that I worked with legacy app, so I, I, did, I was sick of doing web forms. I'm not a big fan of ASP or MVC. Like, I love the web, web API part. But MVC, because you find yourself, you need to do lots of JavaScript anyways. So you're not really, it's not really helping you too much. It's great to do server-side rendering, but we'll get into that and how you can do that with that tool. And strategies for buy-in, right? So depends on you're, whether you're a decision maker or someone who helps decision makers. You have a different role and you have to do different things. But you guys know, as a developer, you don't work 40 hours a week and never look at code or think about code again. If you do, you stay here, right? You have to spend, you can't rely on your companies to train you. It's not gonna happen. 
Yeah, this is really why, right? So when you're doing this, it's, it's horrible. I think web forms is horrible, but I don't know if I've made that point very clear yet, but I definitely think it's horrible. Um, so we want to be able to add new functionality without breaking things or without creating a huge, you know what, you want to change a couple labels. Well, it's going to take three weeks, so I want to use React. Like, that's obviously not going to happen. I want to use Angular or something like that. So yeah, so this you can make like self-contained additions to a page. You just point to a part of the page in the DOM and you say, this is where my stuff's going to be. It's going to take care of itself. It's going to do its own data access. It's not going to break anything else, which is good. You don't have to touch that old horrible code. I hate web forms. They said it. So Galt and JSN. So that's what we're going to start with, right? So anyone get anyone lint their JavaScript? Anyone to figure out horribly your JavaScript? Anyone do that? No. It is scary though, because you have to be careful when you turn it on. Because if you turn it on on old JavaScript, it's going to be like a disaster. So what you basically got to do with it, and so get to do it is you kind of just take like this is the new clean area of this folder, and that's where I'm going to start. Because you can't deal with eight years of JavaScript and expect to clean that up. You know, <coughs> and you wouldn't want to. Because you can introduce bugs, all that kind of stuff like that. So I said, don't be scared of linting. It's like coding the style, right? So go. It's basically a build system like MS build, but for like front end components. It's basically very simple. It grabs files, modifies them, and puts new files. Right? So in that process, you can do things with those files, obviously. But what the good thing about it is, Gulp doesn't try and do everything. It relies on, it's also bad because then you have to deal with other libraries. But it's good because you're not relying on one giant behemoth to figure everything out for you. So why build? What, what benefit do you get, right? So you get minification. Everyone do minification here on the web. Everyone on their web project do, right? Who doesn't do minification on JavaScript and CSS? Everyone does, because there's only two people put their hands up that didn't do it, and no one put their hands up that didn't do it. So either we don't understand what minification means. So like .NET does it, right? .NET, and then there's like .NET 4. It came with minification, all that stuff like that. So you can start doing it very easily. But the problem is, you can't, you're limited in what you can do with it. But it's good because you can minify, concatenate, lint, and then you can compile lesser SAS. Everyone use lesser SAS, anyone use lesser SAS before? Okay, well, lesser SAS is just a precompiler. So everyone has the CSL hell, right? Where you're kind of changing. Oh, is that too hard to see? So everyone has that like thing where you have to change a color in your CSS. But then you go 100,000 places to change it. Then you change it to a place you didn't want to change it because that's that was the same color, but it's for a whole different animal. So this is basically you create variables, and we're not going to get too much into it, but you can do that with this. And run your unit tests. Who runs unit tests? I assume if only two people are minifying their JavaScript, even less of that is running unit tests against JavaScript. So I'm sure people who had tried running unit tests against JavaScript, it's not as easy. Anyone running unit tests like crazy against C sharp? Come on, people, it should be every hand. Okay, so why not Grunt? So Grunt is came before Go, and it was good, but you had to do a lot of configuration. So you had a lot of like files, and you would create like these object literals, and it had all these rules in it, and it kind of tried to do everything itself. It was kind of slow. It was good. You can run tests. You can do linting. You can do all that stuff. But Go came along. And it was faster. And also, very cool logo. More than a warthog, right? Although, they'll both kill you in different ways, I assume. <laughs> so, basically, you have four functions in Gulp, and then you rely on plugins to do modifications while you're within those. So, you have a task, you have a source. So, if you can read this, basically, you see the word globs. Globs is like a Either a list of files that you want to do the that gulp task on, or it's a pattern. So like you see there, if you can't see it, star star slash star dot js basically gets everything that has a JS extension and will run things against it. So that is a gulp task. Now I'm going to show you some code outside of here. So you're living there where you use things in PowerPoint and code. Can you guys see that? That's somewhat readable. Okay, so 
Anyone seen like that weird var gulp equals require gulp before? It's basically called common JS modules, and we'll get into that a little more. What it allows you to do is allows you to have these dependencies, like using statement kind of thing. But you don't have to create a long ass JavaScript file anymore. You can just require those functions and modules. And then you can make your thing just about hinting, it's not that big. And that's gonna lint everything that's under your source of JavaScript. That's it. And then you can have like a custom rule thing here. But we'll get into like a little code how that works. And then you have notification, right? So if you have errors, which you will, unless you have no idea of JavaScript code, just gonna happen. We're gonna make it really annoying because you're gonna get a stupid tray icon that says, you have lint errors, fix them. And so you won't have this horrible JavaScript where people are not putting semicolons, people put all kinds, you can get really strict, but you can start slow. That's what basically it is, right? It's like the soup Nazi, but for JavaScript. You get, like, you, like I was in a meeting and I was talking about it, and the person's like, that tray thing's annoying. I'm like, yes, that is the damn point. It's supposed to be annoying. Because you don't want to do it. Because what happens is, people just kind of keep going, right? You just keep, like, it's a whole broken windows theory, where it's you just kind of, you don't get any better because you're like, oh, let's look at how horrible this code is. I'm not going to bother fixing it, right? But if everyone does that, and what's sometimes the worst part is when you realize you're the person who did that code like six years ago. You're like, who was this idiot? You're like, and you look at the, the source control list, it was you. It's like, that's tough. That's a tough one to deal with. So I'll kind of bring out, where are we? I won't be too, doing too much live coding, but I'll do a little bit. Nothing to fear but fear itself, right? Okay. So, I know what you're saying is, how come I can't see it on your screen? Because I haven't moved it over yet. All right. So this is WebStorm. Um, for front-end development, I found that Visual Studio is great for a lot of things, but I think it's doing too many things lately. I don't know if people agree with that or not, but for just strict like JavaScript, CSS, I use this a lot. And it's, so people, it's JetBrain, so people make me sharper, yes? Oh, is it too hard to read? Yeah. Depends on the projector, yes. I will switch on. Sure. I will do that. That view on here. Too bad. We've all seen JavaScript a lot worse than that. But that's because it's one function. So with WebStorm and, and Visual Studio, we all know that there's that reformat trick where you just reformat it to some style you have in Visual Studio. If you don't know that, Visual Studio has it. Most IDEs have it. So it makes it easy to fix. So if you run this task, and I keep looking at my screen, which is not helpful. So here's your gulp tray, and so Visual Studio Extensions has this, has no tools built in. They, you will not built in, you have to download as a package ex to extend Visual Studio. But um, there's a lot of web tools for that. But so you run it, and then you run this little task. You can probably look at it, right? It's like this. We kind of go through what it looks like. So it's nice, this is your gulp file kind of originates from. And Zoom in so you guys can see it, and then let's pop that over, and then it's like whoa, that's it. So this little this little helper library does and again. You'll have full access to this. Basically, it says go in this folder, recursively find all the tasks. It just kind of so if you have two tasks, not a big deal. But if you start getting thirty tasks, you don't want to have to manage which ones run. It's just simpler and kind of see. It. As we go on, we'll see more complex versions of it. So this is the should have picked that bigger font here. So basically, let's go a little more. All right. So what I did actually, I can keep it up a little bit. I expose, I expose these functions, but basically that's it. So it just runs JSN module, has a little reporter, and we'll run it, see that annoying tray. It's gonna be on my computer, I bet, because that'd be awesome, that'd be so helpful. Awesome. Oh, no, maybe it'll be here. Yeah, uh, you know what? Yeah, it's definitely going to be on my own computer because I'm not mirrored. Hey. My icon, oh, yes. 
It's right here, I promise. This is not a joke, but... So basically, you get a little thing that basically tells you these things. It's like, missing semicolons, you get all these weird, lots of spaces issues. And again, that's just one file. And if you see... Boop. Right? I'll use this, and then... Oh, then it should be good. So that's it, and then you fix it. So with developers, um, we're known to be a little lazy, right? So it's nice to get that little kick in the butt, right, when you make a mistake, and then you don't make your code worse. That's the, like the Boy Scout rule, right? Leave a better place than you found it. Well, this helps with that. So I didn't really get into that, but Airbnb, everyone knows Airbnb. They used it, probably maybe not. But Basically, they become huge for their JavaScript uh, style guides. So you can create your own with JS Hint and, and other libraries like that, but it's not worth it. Because it doesn't really matter, right? It doesn't truly matter what your style is, as long as it's consistent, as long as it looks like one developer wrote it. So when you get to that code, you don't see like some 100 line method or 200 line method. I get upset when it's like eight lines, more than 10 lines. I'm like, more than one conditional, I'm like, that's, that's too many conditionals. Okay, so browserify. So if you look back to those require things, the benefit of those, you can write just modular JavaScript. And so you don't have to write these long, you know those JS files that go for like a thousand lines of code. It's just like random global functions and global variables and all kinds of crazy stuff. With modules, you can just break it into small pieces. And then you can test these pieces. It makes it a lot easier. So what Browserify does is it makes those modules and it turns it into like a JavaScript ready for the web for you. Because obviously those require things aren't going to work in the web. So Browserify goes through and allows you to kind of build that out for you. It makes a JavaScript file. It's, you can minify it. You can do all that stuff like that. It's going to be linted, all that, stuff, all that, include the one file in your code. And that can be thousands of JavaScript files that you're there for. So CommonJS, so there's a couple module formats for the web. There's require.js, and there's CommonJS, and a couple others, and people have created libraries that's for modular JavaScript. CommonJS for a long time was just server-side JavaScript. So when people started making Node, CommonJS was a way to do those modules because again, they didn't want to have those long, hideous JavaScript files. But the problem was, it didn't go to the web. So then that browser file came and changed that. And there's other tools that do it now, but we don't have to get into that. There's like Webpack, and, and there's positive and each, of course. But there's basically three main variables as you require, as you've seen, and there's exports and module. So module is you decide what that module exports and what it makes public. So you can have private that data in JavaScript, which is not always easy to do. So that's what it looks like, really. So we kind of saw that function already. And so this is your module, and it exports that function. Right? So you can make another private function above that it calls that it relies on, but you're only exposing this thing. Right? It's a very useful bit of JavaScript, I'm sure. It tells you when things are greater than or equal to another thing. Um, you can use that. You don't, don't worry, you have to pay me for that. that was good. <laughs> free, free to use. And then all you do, instead of like having that or making sure that other JavaScript files loaded before, you don't care. All you care is I'm going to require that I need this function. And this function is going to have that code. That's all I know. It's going to have an API that's called number greater than or equal to, because that's what I've called it, my local variable here. And then you pass your numbers and you get a true or false. Not much to it. So we kind of look at that. But uh, it's nothing too exotic. So let's get it. Bright light. So look at this kind of crazy golf thing. I saw that already. Okay, so this is what a browserify thing looks like. It's crazy. We're not going to look at too much because you'll never want to use it. 
because it's kind of scary. But what it's kind of really doing is, again, here's your requires, right? So these are all these little things. Like you have this thing called Watchify. And what Watchify does is great. So we don't have to keep running the whole task over again. What Watchify does is every time you make a file to one of your JavaScripts, the file that's required, it automatically rebundles everything for you. So when you're working, you just save and brought you, and you can get tools that come in here and reload the browser for you. Like you may have known that in like web extensions for Visual Studio that does that now. But you, by the time you go to the browser, it's all refreshed for you. And you know, you know dev tools, you can disable cache on Chrome dev tools, or you can disable cache when dev tools is open. Please use that setting. It'll save you those control F5s all the time and always worrying about cache. But th this does, you go there, it's already for you. Like it's you made that change, you don't have to like hit F5 to run your one little code behind change you made in your web form. See web forms. We're gonna stop shitting on web forms. I'm gonna stop. I promise. But um, so basically it's kind of runs through this kind of thing. And, and you can set like a release version of it. Where are you? And so like when you're in like dev mode, you wanna see, you wanna do like put breakpoints in, all that stuff like that. But when you're not dev point, dev mode, and you're in production, you wanna be able to like set release mode and then it just minifies it and it's all uglified. It's properly named uglified. I think. So that's kind of it. So what it basically does is you see it's starting launch. So all that does is if I make changes to anything. If I change this, let's say. No semicolon. Yeah, no semicolon. And so while it's doing that, it's actually rebuilding that app JavaScript file that I'm using on my web page. So you kind of build it up, you make new modules, all that stuff like that. Any module changes, it all bundles up, refreshes for you. No more F5 for a change. And that's kind of small, but it's not a big deal. So what it really does, if you look at the, let's bring up the index file, the web file, a lot going on in this web page. There's absolutely nothing going on in this web page. So just calling this function. So if you look at that function, as we saw in the code, that um, require it and you just run it over and over again. That's basically it. And you don't, have, you don't really care how that works. You have no, there's no dependency really except its external API. And namespacing. So people namespace their JavaScript. So what happens sometimes, especially if you have bad JavaScript, people make lots of global functions. They'll override the global function you wanted, and then you're kind of calling the wrong function. Um, dynamic languages are fun, aren't they? I know. Can't do that in C sharp, but JavaScript's fun, but it has problems, of course. But that's one of the big ones, right? So but if you namespace, you're gonna wipe out anything anyways. So if you use proper namespaces, like this is legacy, it's legacy docs, and that was appropriate. So you won't have to worry about things overriding it. You know? Okay, so if we look at this beautiful web page, it's really nice. Uh, nothing there. But I just wrote to the console while I did it. That's all it's doing. Just running over and over again. False, true, true, false. You can verify that. Oh, uh, anyone know this one? With nan, complete. Anyone know that makes sense? So nan equals nan. You know, everyone knows what nan is in JavaScript? Not a number. Not a number does not equal not a number. <laughs> they can never equal each other. It's very odd. It's one of those fun, like JavaScript has the definition of truthy and falsy. That's like one of those things, right? So like if you, if something's undefined or null or or zero, it's all false. So that's like, and the weird thing is when NAND comes into play, NAND, you say, if a variable is NAND, another variable is NAND, they're not gonna be equal. It's very, it's very annoying. But it's very rare, it becomes an issue. So yeah, tools, kind of went through it. I'll get through this, we'll go through the next section, we'll take a little break. But tools, WebStorm, or you can get no tools for Visual Studio, you can do all those things. Um, it's nice if you have a giant solution with lots of like other like c -sharp projects. And that gets really big and slow with Visual Studio sometimes. You can know, open WebStorm for just your web client. And it's a lot smaller, so when you try to find JavaScript, it's, re it's really good to find functions in JavaScript. The IntelliSense is really rich. And you have a smaller project to deal with. You don't have to have all those other projects you have to deal with with Visual Studio. React. So, anyone you talked about before who's really heard of React, not that many people. I've finally forgiven Facebook for all my ex-friends' form bill updates. Everyone loves those, right? It's like, 
around how many points they got in Farmville. It's like, that is a, definitely enough reason to stop being their friend. If you're one of those people, too bad. Stop playing Farmville. I don't even think, does it even exist anymore? So React is just the UI. So we'll talk about Flex and what that brings to the thing. So <coughs> as a virtual DOM, we'll talk about what the virtual DOM is. And it's, it's big thing is one way reactive data flow. So it simplifies the way data flows. When you look at certain data binding things, it gets really hard to tell what the hell is depending on what. This tries to simplify it. I think it does. Um, but being just the UI, you can use it for other things. You can use it, they have a port for MVC, so you can use an ASP or MVC called reactjs.net. <coughs> and that's on the on my GitHub thing on the one tutorial for that. It's got that. So you can do it with MVC. You don't need to do any other weird things with JavaScript. You just do it like that. It's pretty good. So why React? So I, I left it from almost like a legacy point of view, but also if you're doing new apps, I, I would use it too. I like this. You can try it out incrementally. You don't have to rewrite your app to use React. You don't have to rewrite a page to use React. You can just add new functionality to an existing page. And the big thing with some of the other ones is that Facebook and Instagram actually use them on their important products. In fact, React is all on Facebook. It's all of Facebook and Instagram is now. Yes, Instagram does a website. But all of it is in React components now. And it's about composition. So it's like very much like Lego blocks, where you create these little modules and you kind of piece them together, and they make one giant thing, or a small thing. So one-way data binding. So anyone use here use like two-way data binding, like JavaScript libraries? Like sometimes it can get really, if you have a lot of things working with the same object, it's really difficult to understand which one is like the source of truth kind of thing. And the big exciting news is not just for the web. So React is now it's React Native, where you can actually write the same components for your web app as iOS and assume to be Android, not Windows Phone. But if you're a web developer and you're using it, it's great that you can somehow use the same components pretty much as you're using for the web. So again, you're making a different interface. You're making different things anyways. But it is pretty cool. Other thing is server-sider rendering. Like an apple cider? No. It's server side rendering. So you don't have to do it where you have that weird little loading, that extra little load, because it's not server rendered. You can pre render and make it server rendered so it comes up with your page if you want. It's a little extra work, but if you really need, the big thing it's really for is like search engine optimization. If you want to make a site and you really want that, then you probably need to do that, or else you will not get that. That's the problem with those other libraries. like. As we'll get into the other ones, that the search engine optimization is lost because of those client side rendering. So, why not the other guys? Anyone here used Angular? A few of us? All right. So, Angular was made by Google, kind of, and they use a few products where you're kind of using it. There are big version 2.0 is coming, and Microsoft people are loving it. So, there's a lot of Microsoft people loving Angular right now. Um, Last Visual Studio release, it was like Knockout that was their big love, but that died. Knockout's kind of cool, but other things are replacing it. So you have Backbone. And we used Backbone before. A couple of people. Ember, Durandal. So Durandal is probably not that people have heard of Durandal. But Durandal is uh, Rob Eisenberg. He made this awesome library. I liked it a lot. I used to love it. He was going to make a new version, but then the Angular folks got a hold of him and said, we're on the same page as you. Let's make an awesome library together. So he left to go to Angular, and I was super excited. I'm like, oh great, Angular 2.0 is going to be great. Six months later, he left. He goes, I hate where this is going. I'm making my own thing again. This is a horrible disaster. He hates it. So not that it's terrible, but it is cool they're doing like TypeScript. They're going to use TypeScript as their base thing. So if you've used TypeScript before, it brings some static checking kind of thing to JavaScript. So you won't override someone else's little function easily. Uh, Ember, very opinionated. So as you start going through, through these things, it's hard to just like fit those in. Like you, can, you can't just like add a little component. You could, but it's not really what they're meant for. Like a lot of them are very opinionated stacks. Like this is how you should do this, 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 and this. If we're in legacy, you're limited, right? You gotta work with what you have. And Knockout was okay, it was basically, it's not the same thing. 
Monaco just data binds. It's not an actual full MVC single page app thing. But Durand will actually use Monaco. And Aurelia is just the new version of Durand now that he left Angular. He's a really smart guy. He's made like Caliber and Micro for MVVM for other libraries. He's really smart. We like Monaco, but I'm on now. So one of the things that kind of why I went and I picked it because I really saw a lot of mo 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 movement and momentum around it. Like big companies who are known for front end stuff are moving to it. Not just Facebook and Instagram. And think about like the type of load they're taking, the way they, they just said it, they couldn't work with regular libraries. It just didn't work. Because you'd have like things like unread notifications. Those were very difficult to manage. And so they couldn't do it. So like Airbnb, which used to be all back home, they're going full at it. Khan Academies were doing the whole thing. Yahoo Mail, everyone uses Yahoo Mail, I don't know. But Yahoo Mail is still, I guess a lot of people use it. I'm not one of them. So Flipboard, people use Flipboard for mobile. Um, really rich mobile app, or like device app. They didn't make a web, web app for a long time because they couldn't do what they wanted in the web. React changed that for them. They created an open source project that was called Canvas, but you can do all those rich Flipboard stuff on the web now. GitHub issue viewer, Lassian hip chat. The list is getting really big. And I didn't pick it just because of that, because I really like it too. But it's weird to see a JavaScript library that gets adopted like this. Like to me, it's like jQuery obviously is like the big king of what that is. When everyone just kind of took it and didn't use the other tools. But like this is to, and today of all the options, that's a big one. So virtual DOM. So what it really does is, the way React kind of does it is, it has this like virtual DOM where it's like a lighter version of the real DOM. Everyone knows what DOM is. It's just a basic web page. And so it's really hard because when you do like this dirty checking, you have to go like find that key in the web page, then change it, right? So what they did is, let's just create, whenever you make a change, let's re-render the whole thing, which sounds horrible and slow and terrible. But they're only re-rendering in their what? Their, Virtual DOM is not very evil, it's funny. But, um, and then what the difference is, then they make that difference to the actual real DOM. So maybe just one difference, maybe zero differences. That actually can happen to the DOM. They don't have to navigate through that real DOM. Now if it's virtual DOM, there's a change that updates it. So basically if you have like a list, and like list has like two values in it now, and now it has, you remove one, now it's one. They use like key values to look it up kind of thing, and they will say, okay, that one's missing, now remove it. Or the DOM just remove that element. Um, yeah, only update one real change with real changes only. So JSX, this is the part that gives people a little weird. You start seeing it's like JavaScript, HTML, kind of, right? And then some CSS. There's no CSS for the JavaScript class name, but that's really awkward, right? And it's like it's really weird, like. At first, like, this doesn't make any sense. But when you think about it, you've been doing it forever. Like, you're putting, like, whether you're using Angular or any of those things, you're putting some weird little tags in your HTML. It's really what it is. But it's like, why are we playing around? Let's just do it. And the good thing about this, I really like it, because of the modularity, and you can make little tiny modules of web pages. It's really cool. And they can, each module can do its own data access, all that stuff. So, So I guess the real benefits is you can really, again, back to linting. You can lint your code, you can minify your HTML now, you can type check, you can be testable. Like type checking for your like view and like, And the testable, so if you want to do like full stack testing where you'd be like, like if you try web testing now and use like any of those tools that have to like manipulate the DOM to run your tests, it's so really a pain in the ass. And the tough part with that is is like, you make a little change and your test breaks. It's like, it's really a pain. Like one little tiny HTML change and make a bunch of tests break. This is, you write unit test against it, it's JavaScript. It's a couple minutes later. So, think, so React needs to think differently. And so you break it, like I said, it's like Lego pieces, right? So you have this whole page and each little section is its own little thing that has its own business rules. But you kind of build them together. In the end, it's one. But you just kind of build all these little modules. You can swap them out. You can do all that. And 
So you basically kind of get what you want. You get the you get the the designer gives you a nice little mock-up. It's always easy to do, of course. You can always do what the designer says. Adobe Photoshop and Web is a lot different than each other, but designers don't realize that. So you create a static version of the page. You just mock it up and all these static modules. Then you're like, okay, I have the site all marked up. Now, like, how does the state fit in? Where's data access? What things got to change? You kind of build that up like that. So it allows you to kind of put things together a little differently. But you decide where your state should live. So, so basically there's two major components to a React component. There's state and props. So props, properties, are things you pass from one component to the other. So you just pass data down. So you're the parent or the owner. It's not necessarily parent child, but you're the owner and say, I have this data. Here are your little React component. Take this little data. Do with it what you need to do. So that's like that one-way data. So the data comes floats usually down through the stack of modules. And then state is the internal state of the module. So anything, if it ever changes, it re-renders everything. That whole component re-renders if any of, those, any of those things change. But again, it's not actually rendering the actual DOM, it's rendering this virtual DOM. And if there's any differences, then I'll update that one little component or whatever component that did that. This is state. So let's say you set it, like you can't just Say this dot state my key kind of thing. You have to set it that way. It's just like key values, like, a, like a, basically like an object literal. If you use a lot of JavaScript, it's basically what you're doing. And you put your key in, you set your new value. But that's how you get the value from it. I know you would think you just do this dot state dot my key equals my value, but they actually want you to set it that way. As a bunch of internal me mechanics into it that do what it needs to do because of it. But you have to be very careful with state and props. All that stuff like that. Because if you have two elements that are op two different React components and they're both managing state, but it's like shared state, that can it just ask you for trouble. But the good thing with React Dev Tools, with Chrome Tools and Firefox and stuff, is it warns you if you do stuff like that. It'll tell you, hey, you're doing something you shouldn't do that, or you're missing a key here. You're asking for trouble down the road. So. Basic React component, let's start looking at the code so it's a little easier to see besides back points. But every React element has to have a render function. And what the render function is, is basically just saying this is what the component's going to output to the, to the DOM. So it's all about the DOM, it's all about the web page, right? So everything has to have a render, it's not a React component, it's just a JavaScript file. And you have an initial state where if you first, when you first load that object, if you want certain values to be something, to be certain values, you want them certainly assigned only on the initial state, you set that there. So whether it's a, like a pre-selected value in a select dropdown or the hell you want it to be, it doesn't really matter, but you can control that. Prop types are cool because you can do static checking in component. So you can say oh, all things coming in, this thing needs to be a string, this thing needs to be an integer, or numbers, sorry, no integers in JavaScript, there's only one number type. The, uh, the feeling on is that JavaScript did a great thing. They picked only one number type. Unfortunately, they picked a horrible number type. <laughs> As opposed to most languages have lots of horrible options. But uh, really, a number is a number. I don't know why we have so many different number types in other languages. So you have mix-ins. So mix-ins are like shared functionality that each component can have. And you can kind of use them on multi-components um, <coughs> and object statics. So you can see that. I'm not sure if you can. But this is what prop types does. So you can say that variable needs to be an array. That has to be an array. That has to be a string. The benefit of this stuff, obviously, is when you're reacting, when you're rendering them, you're going to get errors and stuff like that if those things aren't that. So if someone accidentally passes the wrong type of thing, that's really cool. You can say it's got to be a function. If you're doing callback functions, it's got to be, you can make it, you can make a custom kind of prop types. And then you can really start doing that to make sure that people aren't passing the wrong thing. So when val value is provided for a prop, a warning be shown in the JavaScript console. The performance frequency prop, prop types is only check in development mode. Because why would you want that in production? Hopefully your users aren't having dev tools up trying to see if you have errors. You don't really care if they do that. You don't, want to, you don't need to have that. It's not worth having all that code there just for that. So you could keep your um, app in development mode if you really wanted to keep them, but I would not see the purpose. 
I think that's mostly for development. You have to remember running unit tests for it. Right? You can write unit tests in JavaScript where you're testing types. It's like you want to spend unit test time. A lot of people aren't actually doing a lot of unit tests. But if you want to spend that time on like whether something's a string or a number or a function, like that's a lot of testing you don't need. If you can use it in the context. So this is a basic React component. And so it's using what like we talked about before, the common JS module with browser find. Like that would be a hint error. Can you tell me tell me why that first row row would be a hint error? That first row, that first line of code? Double code. Double code, yes. So you pick one. Like it doesn't matter which one you use, but pick one, basically. You in your settings, your JS in settings, your CS settings, you just pick which one you want. But this would throw a giant ugly tray thing. I can draw it if you want a marker, but it would just say use single quotes. And then so these are mix-ins, so like route React router. So if you want to make a single page app, you need a router, right? So you need to when people hit the back button, the back button doesn't take you where you were an hour ago. You want every time you change on the page, you want to keep that in your browser history. Because users hit the back button. If you make your own back button, that's terrible, don't do it. <laughs> people do not use it. I don't care how pretty you make it, how big you make it, people will always go to that stupid button. So don't break the browser. Use the browser. So that's what React Router basically does. So it allows you to kind of, we're not going to talk about that too much, but I just want to show how you're using mixins and that is mixins. So you can access variables and, and, and private functions of that just by using those mixins. It's basically all you do. Here's your get initial state. So your initial state when this thing um, renders is from a prop. So let's say the owner of this, whoever called this sample class, would pass in an optional string. In. It's kind of funny that um, you're not making it required to make an optional string, but you're setting that initial state. So this only happens once. And we'll get into the, the different life cycles, but this only kind of happens once per component. And then render happens constantly. So every time you change your state, if you use this dot set state, re-render. Pass new different props in, re-render. So you don't have to worry about that. It just re-renders and you let the diff engine decide what the hell should be updated. And then you export it. So you can export the sample, you export that class, right? So anything can just require sample. And it only return, and they would only have access to what's in that create class. If you had other private functions up there, it doesn't export it. It only exports what you want to export. So private variables in JavaScript. You can do it now without this. You can create like revealing module patterns and all kinds of great patterns that do it. But this makes it a lot easier. So the lifecycle methods, we'll talk about each one. So component will mount. So every little lifecycle method of a React component gives you opportunities to do different things. Some like this. Um, this happens before any rendering occurs. So it's about to mount, hasn't mounted yet. So mounting is when it's mounted to the DOM. Okay, so component did mount. So this happens once the initial rendering occurs. It follows a DOM representation. So if you want, and you have all these great jQuery extensions you've been using, that's where you do that. Right, yes, or update, let's remember. So many functions, I think this is where you do it, yeah. So React, I find out on this, yeah. So if you have like some data table thing or whatever bootstrap JavaScript thing you have, you can render it. You just get the DOM that's re rendered and then you can manipulate it, manipulate it the same way you did before. Okay. So component receive props. Whenever you get whenever the owner of that component passes something different in, it, that function runs. And then and not called during initial. So only when the props come in after initial when they change. And should component update, invoke before rendering the new props or state being received. The method is not called for initial render, so very similar to the other one. And then will update. Um, so right before it does, the update, and then both did update. So this is where when you can do things like flushing things, and if you have extra kind of methods in there, you can do that. You can do it here too. Invoke immediately before component is unmounted from the DOM. So when this component is removed, there might be some cleanup stuff you need to do. If you're listening to something or something like that, or some timer, anything like that, this thing kind of says, clear that all out. Okay. And then we can take a break and we can do some, does that make sense, break now? Yeah.
Okay? And then we'll do a little demo after. Okay?